So hello everyone. My name is Thaisa Shams and I'm a doctoral student at the Federal University of Paraná. Today I would like to welcome all of you to this lecture, part of Abralinha ao Vivo Linguists Online. This is an initiative from the Brazilian Linguistics Association in partnership with a number of other oh, of other linguistic. I'm oh, sorry, uh, I had a problem here. Uh, so this is an initiative from the Brazilian Linguistics Association in partnership with a number of other linguistic associations around the world. This now regular series of lectures and panel sessions is designed with the goal of giving students and researchers free access to state-of-the-art discussions on diverse topics and theoretical approaches to the study of human languages. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Hedy Zelstra. He's a full professor at the Seminar for English Philology at the University of Göttingen. You may know him as one of the authors of the book Introducing Syntax, among of a number of other interesting and insightful works, particularly on the themes of negation and polarity and the nature of formal features, which is, by the way, the topic of today's talk. He's a member of the editorial boards of some of the most influential journals in linguistics, as well as the associate editor of Natural Language Linguistics and linguistic theory and the general editor of linguistic variation. His lecture today is entitled Building Blocks of Language and is focused, as I've just mentioned, on the nature and acquisition of formal features. So welcome, Professor. Thank you very much for your participation. I'm sure we are all very excited. And I'd like to remind the audience that if you have any questions for Professor Hede uh, or about the topic, you can put them in the chat channel on YouTube, and at the end, during the discussion session, we'll go over them. So without further ado, I turn this over to Hedy. Thank you very much. And first of all, thanks for the invitation. Also, thanks for this wonderful initiative. And let me share my screen so that we can start with the presentation. And as I already told Thais, um, if there's any question of clarification that comes up during the talk, feel free to also uh, let her know via the chat function so that I can uh, hopefully answer that. So what I will do in this talk is talk about grammatical building blocks. That is the units that, yeah, are primarily responsible for the building of grammatical sentences. Mm -hmm. And for that, I will start with looking at a particular phenomenon that is much more pervasive in natural language and may appear at first sight, and that are so-called four meaning mismatches, and especially four meaning mismatches that are of the type many to one. And to see what is intended by that, let us look at the following examples, which is about an old hobby of mine, namely negative concord. In a language like Italian, but this holds for a variety of Indo-European languages and also languages outside the Indo-European language family. If there's two elements that can independently yield a semantic negation, jointly they can only yield one. So in Italian, you have Gianni non ha telefonato, Gianni not has called, just as you have nessuno ha telefonato, nobody has called. But strikingly, if you have a sentence like non ha telefonato nessuno, literally not has called nobody, it doesn't mean that somebody called, that is not nobody, but rather that nobody called. It appears that one of the two negations does not seem to be semantically active. And in this sense, we have a many to form, many to one for meaning mismatch, namely many negative forms and only one negative meaning. Many to one four meaning mismatches are not restricted to negative concord. Also in the domain of tense semantics, you find very similar phenomenon. So here's a very simple sentence, at least simple at first sight. John said Mary was ill. Now the most salient reading of this sentence is that at some point in the past, John said, Colin, Mary is ill. That's not the only meaning this sentence has. A second meaning of the sentence is where John again at a time in the past said, Mary was ill, the so-called backward shifted reading. Now, this is a very striking phenomenon because there's two general ways to think about the meaning of a past tense. Either it means something like before the time of utterance, or it means something like before a local evaluation time. That is, it's either an absolute past tense or a relative past tense. 
Now, if past tense is indeed a relative past tense, the first reading, the simultaneous reading, could not be understood because then war should, the illness should take place prior to the time of saying. But if uh, the meaning of a past tense is just prior to the time of utterance, the third reading, where John at some point in the past said, Mary will be ill, a so-called forward-shifted reading, should be possible as well, contrary to fact. So it's very hard to understand the meaning of this seemingly uh, simple sentence. Now, there's a variety of other potential examples of many-to-one relations um, in grammar or yeah, between syntax and semantics. Binding is a very good example where one of the same discourse reference is marked both by an antecedent and an anaphore. Or case where the presence of one functional head is actually marked by one or more case marked elements. A nominative might mark the presence of a finite T head. Selection, that for instance, a pre pre preposition selects a DP is in a way also an instance of a four meaning mismatch because the presence of the DP is manifested twice in the morpho syntax by the DP itself and by the selecting head. And finally, what we see in cases of movement is that one particular element occupies more than one structural position and therefore in a way, a slightly more abstract way also yields something that you can see as a four meaning mismatch. Two structural positions, one meaning. Now, the question is, what is the nature of all such dependencies? And bigger questions that you might address here are, what underlies these syntactic dependencies? What kind of syntactic features are involved? Why is the syntactic configuration the way it is? And also, what is the relation between all those syntactic features and the semantic operators whose presence they signal? Now, if you look in the literature, what you will see is that all these relations, all these dependencies have in common, that there's one particular element almost flagging the necessity of the presence of another element. So in the domain of agreement, people say that there's a phi probe that needs to be checked. In the domain of negative concord, it's argued that negative indefinites need to be licensed by negative markers. Past tense markers need to be evaluated against a higher evaluation time. And of course, need an antecedent, Case markers on DPs uh, impose restrictions on the presence of functional heads there are, and actually the same holds for all other kinds of selectional re requirements, where a head indicates a necessity of some complement or specifier, and also very often movement takes place to satisfy some higher selectional or other requirement. Now, what I will claim in this talk, and I will argue how far you can go in proving this, is that all these dependencies involve what is traditionally referred to as an unutterable feature. Um, in that sense, it's not that spectacular what I'm saying, but the addition is that all these dependencies do not only involve such an unutterable feature, but rather require it to be checked by a matching C commanding interval feature. That is, the dependent is structurally lower than the element that can satisfy the dependency. And this gives rise to a number of problems. And in joint work with Roman Bjorkman, I've argued that if you strongly distinguish between what you could call checking and what you could call valuation, that is, if you make a fundamental distinction between structure building and structure enrichment, then this claim can actually be maintained. So what do people say for these particular dependencies that we've discussed so far? So when it comes to negative concord, um, there's a line of research, though not the only line of research, that says that negative concord is actually uh, an instance of syntactic agreement. That is, certain negative indefinites should be treated as elements that carry an unutterable negative feature, that is, a feature that requires to be checked by a higher interval negative feature, which can either be covertly or overtly present. So here's an example from Czech, which is a Slavic negative concord language. Nobody not calls, nobody literally, though the sentence means nobody's calling anybody. And then there are different ways of accounting for this. Either one says that the networks, the negative indefinites carry a feature that is an unutterable negative feature, 
that is checked against the interpretable negative feature of the negative marker, or as I've argued myself, it's either case that every overtly present negative element carries an uninterpretable negative feature and has to be checked against a covert uh, negative operator that has an interval negative feature. Irrespective of the two options, the dependent negative indefinites must be C-commanded by the semantic negation. Now, when it comes to sequence of tense, um, the picture is slightly more complicated, but the bottom line is that most analyses of sequence of tense again argue for the presence of a mechanism that says it's not the meaning of the past tense marker itself that is semantically active, but rather the past tense marker encodes the presence of some higher tense operator. Now, there's again various ways in which you can embed that. And in the slides, there's reference made to the work by various impressive pieces of work uh, that aim in doing so. In recent work together with a current graduate student of mine, Karina Kauf, we've argued that the best way to analyze sequence of tense is by indeed assuming that there's a covert past tense operator that checks off the unintermitable past features of the past tense morpheme. In addition, what we say is that those past tense morphemes are not semantically vacuous, but rather are relative non-futures. That is, informally speaking, they have the meaning of something like no later than. And then what we say is that the sentence of John said Mary was ill means that there is the past tense indicated by the past tense operator, such that the saying doesn't take later, place later any time than that past tense operator indicates and that Mary's illness does not take place later than the time of saying. Now, irrespective of the question whether this is a correct analysis or not, what all these analyses on the sequence of tense presume is that there's a syntactic dependency relation between a higher operator and a lower tense morpheme where the morphosyntactic properties of the lower tense morpheme depend on the higher one. So the lower tense morphemes are dependents and the covert operator is the satisfier of that dependency. Now, without going in as much depth here, the same can be said about anaphores. Clearly, anaphores need to be C commanded by their antecedent. And if binding is taken to be an instance of agree, which is currently the most popular stand um, in contemporary syntax, um, given the yeah, many works that have been written on this particular topic, binding should involve an instance of agree that is at least anaphoric binding, where the higher antecedent agrees with the lower anaphore. And something like she likes herself would then be an antecedent she, which has interpretable third person singular um, feminine features that agrees with an element that's dependent on how you exactly look at it, has some kind of an uninterpretable counterpart of that, or at least needs to stand in a feature checking, sharing, or whatever relation with the antecedent. Now, all these things going in slightly more abstract terms could also be said about case. Um, there's a lot of discussion about what exactly underlies case. Many people, though not all, assume that case involves a feature relation between a DP and a particular hat. Um, if that is the case, then this hat, this uh, DP has a property, and you can think of that again as an unutterable feature that is dependent on the presence of this particular functional hat. Um, there has been a bit of discussion lately in syntax on whether case assignment should take place in syntax or both syntactically, um, whatever the exact call of the jury on that is. It is a well-known fact as identified by Bobby Yick that phi agreement is sensitive to case assignment. Phi agreement always targets the highest DP with structural case, which suggests that case licensing precedes phi agreement. And that means that if phi agreement takes place in syntax, so should case assignment. Now, finally, we come to the two maybe slightly more abstract instances of similar syntactic dependencies, um, selection being the first. Selection is something you can think of as a hat that is equipped with some kind of an unadorable feature that determines what the syntactic category of its sister is. So a prepositional phrase has a preposition as with in the example, 
that has a feature that says that it needs a DP as its complement, otherwise ungrammaticality is triggered. Um, similar things hold, for instance, for complementizers that require a finite or a non-finite clause, etc. And then finally, we come to movement. Now, what all these cases have in common so far is that there is a particular dependent and there's a higher element that satisfies the dependency. For movement, prima facie, things look slightly different. And therefore, I'll take a little bit more time in going through uh, the details here. Um, what Chomsky has argued for in his earlier minimalist work is that probes look down in the local C command domain to be valued by a matching goal and that in return, other features such as case features may be checked against the probing hat. Now, this seeking the, uh, mechanism does not guarantee any movement at all. What triggers movement is that if such a probe, like the T probe in the example, that seeks for a nominative, and that nominative can in turn value its five feature, that if that probe has an additional movement triggering feature, also referred to as an EPP feature, that then the goal subsequently raises to the probe specifier position. And you get the order where the DP ends up in a specifier of the TP um, and where the head gets valued and the EPP feature of the head is checked. One of the advantages of such a mechanism is that if an agree relation is established on a distance, um, you don't need to argue for the fact that agreement itself no longer triggers movement. What is really the case is that there's a movement triggering diacritic that makes um, an agreement goal move to a higher position, which may or may not be absent. Um, the problem, however, is that these EVP features, even though technically they may work like any kind of independent motivation, they're really postulated just to make things work. And there might be alternative ways, and one of them um, is a particular version of the notion of upward degree that I worked on together with my colleague and friend Bjorn Bjorkman, um, where we actually say that there is a distinction between what you could call checking and valuation, and that it's ultimately checking that requires the antecedent or the license of the dependency to be higher than what you could call here the probe. And basically it says that a checker must always see command the checkee, and at the same time that probes can trigger a syntactic relation with a lower goal, um, if that lower goal already stands in an agree relation with the probe itself. That sounds very complicated. Um, so I will give a few examples. The crucial thing here, as said before, is that checking requires upward degree, that is checking requires the checker to see command the checkee, and evaluation can add on top of that. So in a plain spec head configuration where the specifier is a result of movement, in an example like we sleep, there's a T probe that seeks, um, looks for five feature and has a case feature, a finite feature that is, um, such a finite feature might agree with a lower DP, which can be thought of as case assignment, the DP then becomes a nominative. Since the T hat and the DP can already talk to each other, the DP is a candidate to move into the specifier of the T hat because the specifier position C commands the hat position. The unutterable five feature can be checked and subsequently be valued um, for five features. Now, if it is the case that agreement doesn't result in movement, for instance, in a sentence like there are glasses on the table, what needs to be said is that there is an agree relation between the DP and the T hat, in this case, glasses, and the T hat realized by R, where glasses indeed, by virtue of agreeing with the T hat, receives nominative case. And on top of that, there's an additional element, in this case, the dare expletive, that ends up in a specifier of the T hat. And from there, it checks the five feature without valuing it. And as a last resort, the phi probe uh, on T can be valued by the lower goal. What this shows is that valuation is something different from checking and that valuation can actually apply in a different direction than checking can, which avoids a number of problems that upward agree would otherwise face. But 
with this in mind, what you could uh, say or claim summing up is that by disentangling checking and valuation, it is possible to account for all the attested syntactic dependencies, including all the ones involving many to one for meaning mismatches in terms of unintelligible features being checked by C commanding matching interval features. And that um, involves phi agreement, negative concord, seekers of tens, binding of NFOS case, selection, and even movement without having to allude to EPP features. As such, I argue that these unintelligible features are very powerful tools. But that, of course, triggers a bunch of additional questions. And those questions I will discuss in slightly more detail in the remainder of this talk. Namely, why is it the case that unintelligible features should actually trigger syntactic operations? And maybe even more deeper, what is the nature of such unintelligible features? What kind of animals actually are they? So let us now look at the inventory of formal, that is formal and or categorical features. Professor? Yes. Uh, we do have a question that I think may be worth to address now. Please. Yes. Uh, so John asks, um, can we get rid of the interpretable or versus uninterpretable distinction on features and just assume a valued unvalued distinction? So that's the question. So I've argued that unintelligible and internal features should be disentangled from valued and unvalued features. And this relates to two central properties of grammar, namely structure building and structure enrichment. Valuation is really about structure enrichment. Pre-existing syntactic structures receive additional feature values in various positions, but the structure itself doesn't get any bigger through it. Structure building is what triggers both internal or external move. Now, in re people have argued, including Omar Preminger, for instance, that you might get rid of uh, the notion of checking, especially in the domain of fire agreement, and that valuation is enough. Now, even though that may very well be right, what I will try to show is that in another, in various other areas, most notably in the domain of selection, actually what you do need is still this checking mechanism that is a structure building mechanism, which involves what I argue are uninterpretable and interpretable features, at least that is how they're traditionally called. What I will show in this second part of the talk though, is that the name interpretable or uninterpretable feature is actually a misnomer in a sense that there's nothing semantic about either of the two and that they're really formal features, dependent and independent features being a better uh, term for them. I hope this addresses John's question. And if not, then I'll hear, but otherwise I will continue. But what John's question really shows is that it's very important to understand what features are actually at stake in a grammar. And if we look at the history of gender syntax, then we see that a whole bunch of features have been postulated for various different phenomena. Interpretable and uninterpretable features, categorical features, selectional features, edge features, EPP features, and a whole more. And the question is what really distinguishes these features and what are the features that one really needs? So if you look at the original art feature architecture by Chomsky, what he said is that the ultimate feature inventory of a grammar is asymmetric in nature, in a sense that phonological features are independent from formal or syntactic features, but that formal or syntactic features do overlap with a set of semantic features as um, indicated in the picture. And then that gives us three types of formal slash semantic features. Truly formal features, which are the traditional uninterpretable formal features, the ones that cannot give rise to any semantic interpretation, purely semantic features, and then members of the intersection, which are formal features that at the same time can also receive a semantic interpretation at the level of LF. And then the driving force for grammar was, be, was that unintelligible features had to be deleted under checking with internal features due to a principle called full interpretation. Now, there's a whole bunch of problems with this particular view, both on the empirical and on the theoretical side. 
empirically, there's no one-to-one -one relation between an integral feature and a semantic property. A very well-known example is the German noun das Mädchen, which is formally neutral, but semantically feminine, of course. Um, there's elements like scissors, which are formally plural, but semantically singular, as in English. Or there's deponent verbs like Latin loqui, which is more of a syntactically a passive, but has an active meaning. Also, what we see is that not every element with a particular semantic property always carries an interpretable formal feature. A very good example of that is the French negative marker pas, which means not, but for presumably historical reasons, has never been able to participate in negative concrete relations, so it cannot be said to have an INEC feature. And indeed, if you have pa plus another negative element in French, you do get a double negation reading. Personne mange pas rien, nobody eats pas slash not. Nothing actually in French means nobody doesn't eat anything. The negative indefinites undergo negative concord, but pa doesn't participate. And reversely, there's also a number of non-negative elements like Spanish for bait, um, which as the example shows, is actually able to license or agree with elements carrying an uninterpretable negative feature, which shows that these elements must have an interpretable negative feature despite being semantically non-negative. So the one-to-one -one correspondence that is necessary between formal features and their semantics in the case of internal formal features can be said to be not always there. At the same time, there's a number of theoretical problems. The first theoretical problem is that uninterpretable features are said to be deleted or erased even in particular configurations. But it is completely unclear why a particular feature just by simply appearing in a particular configuration would end up being deleted. Also, arguably there's no reason why full interpretation itself should apply. Uh, why is it that semantic, sorry, that non-semantic features may not enter the conceptual intentional system? Why would an uninterpretable feature make the derivation crash at the left? And why couldn't it be the case that an uninterpretable feature is simply not being ignored by the conceptual intentional system? And in fact, I've argued that the idea that an uninterpretable feature may make a derivation crash is actually contradictory. Peter Sfinonius has provided in a paper from 2007, a number of definitions for interface features. And he said a feature F is an X feature where X can be phonology, syntax, semantics, even only if F can constitute a distinction between two different X representations. Now, if you fill in semantics for X, then if the presence or absence of a particular feature can make a derivation crash at LF, then any feature that can do so by definition is a semantic feature. The problem is that an unintuitable feature when present at LF makes a derivation crash, whereas it would otherwise be a convergent uh, without it, meaning that the presence of this feature can make cement, the sentence crash for semantic reasons, but that would mean that every unintuitable feature according to Sfinonius definition is actually a semantic feature. That's a contradiction. So I think this calls for another view. And I think the question at stake is really what determines a set of formal features. And here is where I would like to make a connection with what I said at the beginning of today's talk, namely that four meaning mismatches actually determine the acquisition of formal features. So, what I will assume, and this is an algorithm spelled out one after the other, but I will split them up in all four parts, argue that only by virtue of a particular form meaning mismatch, a particular formal that is syntactic feature may emerge and otherwise not. So let's go through all the steps in detail. The first step in acquiring whether there's a particular formal feature is that a language learning child assumes a one-to-one -one correspondence between a particular morpheme and it's a particular semantic content. So let's look at a lang child learning English. No, the child hears sentences like nobody walks or Mary is not angry. And the child may hypothesize that nobody means nobody 
and not means not, and there's nothing more to be said. And in that case, there's no reason for a child to assume anything else, and there wouldn't be any negative feature in a language like English. But now if the child acquires something like Italian, then what a child will hear is sentences like nessuno ha telefonato or non ha telefonato, which mean nobody has called or she didn't call, which suggests a one-to-one -one relation between the negative form and the negative meaning. But on top of that, the child also hears sentences like non ha telefonato a nessuno, meaning she didn't call anybody, where the child receives evidence that is lower than a suno, cannot mean something like nobody. And for that reason, that is a trigger for the child, it should be assigned a, an observable negative feature. As a third step, then by virtue of the fact that the sentence like non a telefonato a nessuno is grammatical, the child should, and means she didn't call anybody, the child should understand that the negative element here should be assigned in addition, a feature that you can call INEC, whose sole purpose is to check off the UNEC feature on a SUNO and account for the grammaticality of the sentence. And as I've argued before, though it is not that important for now, if there's no overt element that can do so, then a covert operator may be postulated to be present, again, carrying such an INEC feature um, that is then responsible for the checking of the uninterpretable negative feature. Finally, as a fourth step, it should be possible for a language learning child to assign a feature INEC to any element that has a feature UNEC that appears in a grammatical sentence and where there's no additional negation present. In this case, if the child hears senza nessuno, it can only assume that this word senza, meaning without, carries a feature INEC despite being a regular semantic negation. What this tells us is that the set of possible formal features does not have to be predetermined by universal grammar, but rather in any case where you have a one, no one-to-one -one corresponding correspondence between a particular form and a particular meaning, that this is where interpretable or uninterpretable features pop up. Um, that is, those formal features actually are not duplications of semantic categories, as is the case in the traditional perspective, but rather they intermediate between sound and meaning in those cases where the mapping is not transparent. This also means, and this is the next step, is that formal features themselves are not defined in terms of semantics. They're purely defined in terms of syntactic restrictions on the environments they appear in. A UNEC does not mean that the thing is necessarily semantically negative itself. UNEC is just assigned to any element that needs to be checked by INEC. And INEC is something that is only capable of checking of a UNEC feature and is not semantically negative itself. It is due to the learnability algorithm that a feature INEC more often than not ends up on an element that is independently semantically negative, but those formal features neither the INEC nor the UNEC features are semantically negative themselves. What are traditionally called uninterpretable features are actually elements that encode purely syntactic dependencies and the same holds for what are traditionally called interpretable features. It's a purely syntactic property of syntax um, that a feature UF needs to stand in a particular relation with a feature IF and vice versa. The relation between the semantics of F and formal features I, F, U, F is actually indirect and only follows via language acquisition. That is, a feature I, F is not the thing that gets semantically interpreted, just as a feature U, F is not something that can ruin the semantic acceptability of a particular sentence. The feature, the picture that emerges is actually the following. The set of formal features and the set of semantic features simply do not intersect. There's phonological features, there's semantic features, and there's formal features that come about in two kinds, UF features and IF features, though, as I will propose, these are rather or better referred to 
as dependent and independent formal features. And for this reason, I even prefer to call them no longer IF and UF, but just F and UF, where this UF, U or UF is really nothing but a diacritic that says, I need to stand in a particular relation, a syntactic relation with an element F, otherwise I'm ungrammatical, but that is a purely syntactic uh, property. Now there's a major advantage of this, and this brings me actually to the third, but also final part of this talk that says that by doing so, and by disentangling the semantic notion of interpretability from the formal notion of syntactic dependencies, being syntactic dependent or being syntactically independent, actually allows us to unify insights from both minimalism and categorical grammar. To see what I mean, let's first look at how lexical representations um, could look like. And before I do that, let me just say that this looks like a lexicalist representation of thoughts. I'm not committed here to those elements being truly lexicalistic or uh, to other frameworks where phonological and or semantic interpretations take place post grammatically. Um, but it's just to show you the picture, an expression like Nesuno has a formal realization, Nesuno, it has a particular meaning, which in this case is that of a semantically non-negative indefinite and crucially for today's purposes, because it's a syntax talk, it has formal features D and features U neck, meaning it belongs to the grammatical category of um, determinus and it cannot grammatically survive without a feature U neck. A cat is being pronounced as cat. It has a feature N because it's a noun. It has a particular meaning and the same holds for prepositions like on, which syntactically have a feature P and a feature UD, which means that it cannot survive without a DP and they have a particular phonological form and semantic representation. Now, what this tells us is that by, look, by taking formal features to be completely syntactic and no longer semantic, it means actually that the, set, the notion of formal feature and the notion of what is a categorical feature can actually be unified. Just as the feature N is the thing that determines what is a noun and the feature N itself doesn't have a particular meaning, this I think holds for any formal feature there is. And if that is the case, it may account for a variety of things in exactly the same way as categorical grammar may account for things or if people have um, attempt doing, attempted doing so. And a variety of the syntactic dependencies that we've discussed before, including a phenomenon known as labeling, can then be, I think, very straightforwardly explained in grammatical terms. So what I will do here is go to the third part of the talk. Let me just recapitulate where we stand. What we argued is that given the existence of four meaning mismatches in grammar, there are, is a necessity for grammatical features that encode a dependency on elements with other grammatical features, be that negative concord agreement, movement, selection, and what have you. And on top of that, that the features that these are identified by means of those four meaning mismatches and that trigger all those operations are purely formal features and nothing more. Now, with this in mind, I would like you to look at a different question that has been pervasive in syntax for a long time, and that concerns labeling. And labeling is nothing but wondering if there's a merger between an element alpha and an element beta, what is the label of the two? So what, if any, is the label of gamma? Um, and then this boils down to two different questions. The first one being, is labeling really required? And if so, is there a unified labeling algorithm that actually will suffice for all cases? Now, the standard approach to the central question is, well, since merge itself is just set formation, there is no reason why merge should preside, should give us a particular label. Merge itself should be label free and then either narrow syntax or the interfaces require a particular label to be present. 
and therefore we need an independent labeling algorithm. And various such algorithms have been presented. Chomsky has argued for kind of a hybrid labeling mechanism where originally he said the label is either one of the two daughters, but later on it could either be one of the daughters or a shared feature of the two daughters. Chris Collins has argued that there's no label at all. Um, David Edger has proposed an exocentric um, view of labeling where the label could actually be something else than alpha or beta. But what I argue is, and with this in mind, actually look at the idea that formal features are really categorical features, is that the central question has received the wrong answer in the first place. The question should not be the case, why is it maybe only one of the two? Um, what makes one of the two uh, features present on either alpha or beta merge or percolate to the top node? Rather, why is it the case that merge basically gives a set union that is why isn't it the case that all formal features part of the daughters of two elements that have undergone a merger don't all appear on the top note? And what I've argued here, what I'll argue here is actually that what is needed is some kind of view on what tells you what syntactic information can percolate up to the next node and what kind of syntactic information may not percolate up. And the idea. It's very simple. The idea says that in principle, every piece of information that is present in the tree should also be available at every next level, that is at every higher position in the tree. Syntactic features should percolate unless there is a principled reason why they cannot do so. That is, if you would have two elements merging, one element existing of a feature F and UG, another element existing of a feature K and UL, then in principle, the top node should be the set of all formal features, FK, UG, and UL. Now, of course, we know that this is not the case. We know that a merger of a verb and a DP is not a feature set that contains a feature V and a feature D. What we actually see, and this is a very simple but straightforward idea, is that given the categorical information of both the features, say G and UG, that if the two stand in a sisterhood relation, neither of the two percolates up. And the reason for this is intuitively very simple. Suppose there's an element that has a feature F and a feature UG. That is a grammatical object, a syntactic object that says, I'm of category F and I cannot survive without an element of uh, category G. Once this merges with an element of category G, what you resort to is an element of category F that no longer needs to merge as an element of category G. So what you can basically say is that when you have merged, every formal feature, dependent or independent, percolates up unless there's a, a pair F, U, F, of present in the two sisters. So one sister F, uh, the other sister containing U, F. In that case, neither F nor U, F percolate up. All the others do. Now that sounds complicated, but it brings back a more simplified view on what is labeling. And what I will argue here is that I think that this makes correct predictions of the labeling of not only had complement merges or specifier bar merges, but also of a junction. And to see that basically what you get with labeling is that the selected feature does not project, the selecting feature does not pro project, but all other features do. So let us just look at a num number of a, a small number of simple cases. If you have a determiner that selects an NP, the determiner has a feature D for being a determiner. It has a feature U and because it requires the presence of a noun phrase, it merges with the noun phrase that is an element of feature N. And the result is something that only has a feature D that is a determiner phrase. Similarly, if you have a preposition um, that selects for a DP, one daughter has, is a feature set P, U, D. The other daughter is a singleton feature set D, that is the DP. And upon uh, merge, only the P feature can percolate up. So the result of the selection is a PP. Now, following earlier proposals, there's not much new here. 
the exact same mechanism applies to specifiers that merge with bar levels. So if you have a little VP, which involves external merge, what you can basically say is that a little V has two selecting features, UV and UD. First, it merges with the big V uh, feature that is the VP. Then you uh, get a feature set little V UD. It may merge with a DP and a specifier that has a feature D. And as a result, there's a single feature little V that is a little VP. Exactly in the same vein, if you have a TP that selects a little VP and again a DP uh, in a specifier, albeit in this case, most likely by means of movement, then again, the T feature has the same selecting features, UD and U little V, and in exactly the same way, it merges first with a little V feature, then with the D feature, and you end up with a T feature. So, one question that at this stage may already pop up is what happens if you would do the selection in the reverse order? As you can see below, is that a T hat has a selecting feature UD and U little v. That means that a priori, nothing forbids the T hat to first merge with a DP, yielding a feature set T UV. This feature set may merge with a little VP, a feature, an element with feature little V, and yield a TP. Strictly speaking, there's nothing that should forbid this. At the same time, what we don't want is TPs with a little VP in a specifier and a DP complement. There's a blunt and a more subtle way to resolve this. The blunt way would just be to rule, to add some ordering diacritics, saying this feature needs to merge first, first that feature needs to merge second. The other way would be to rule out the unwanted orders by either narrow syntactic or interface conditions. For instance, if the semantics of T requires a semantic complement that can only be realized by a little VP, then of course the other order is completely ruled out. Another reason, and for this I'll just go back, if you were to have a configuration like this with the little V in a specifier, it would be impossible for any material, say the little V head itself, to head move into the T head. So all kinds of other observed instances of movement would also be forbidden by the reversal order. And for that reason, these could be said to be ruled out as well. Now, what I will argue is that actually there is a clear prediction that the two options make, namely that if heads are really, or any grammatical object for that matter, is really nothing but a feature bundle that is an unordered set, because sets are by definition unordered, of different features, then in principle, reverse order should be possible unless ruled out by narrow syntax or the interfaces. And that brings in the consequence that it should be possible, at least in some cases, to indeed find such um, flexible orderings. And as I will show later on, indeed, we do find those. Now, before we go to that, let me say that I think that this also forms a solution to a very notorious problem for labeling under bare phrase structure, and that is the labeling of a junction. What we know of a junction is that what we have is an element um, where two, well, you have a maximal projection you merge something to it and you keep a maximal projection. Now, under bare phrase structure, the notion of a maximal or minimal projection is purely structurally defined. In the structure that we find on this slide, the highest instance of X is a maximal projection solely by being the highest instance of X, just as the smallest or the lowest instance of X, by definition, um, is the minimal projection of X and therefore its head. Now, if you have a junction, like a VP junction, what you have is you merge a VP with another maximal phrase, say an adverbial phrase, and the overall result is again a VP. Sleep and sleep often are both VPs. And that is at pure odds with bare phrase structure because why would the highest, if the highest VP is a maximal projection, then by definition, any lower instance of V should not be a maximal projection. And this has been a big problem and for this and many other reasons, 
adjuncts have actually been taken outside the system that derives structures by means of set merge and or labeling. Chomsky has argued that adjunction should actually be generated by pair merge. So there's a whole number of problems related to that. People have argued that adjuncts for these reasons have been subject to late insertion. Um, Hornstein and Nunes have argued that adjuncts actually allow nodes in the syntactic structures not to be labeled. But all these approaches have been primarily introduced to account for the special status of adjuncts under bare phrase structures or similar frameworks. Under the proposal here, however, no such thing is actually necessary. To see that, take the following structure. The proposal gives us a very clear algorithm that once we know the feature set of the daughter, one of the daughters, and the feature set of the top node, that you can easily compute the feature set of the other daughter. Now, in this case, suppose you have a feature set Y on one of the daughters and a feature set X on the top node, it is straightforward that the feature set of the other daughter should be the feature set X UY because there's no Y in the top node and that could only have been the result by virtue of a feature UY as the sister of the feature Y. And similarly, the feature X on the top node should have come from somewhere it doesn't come from Y, so it should have come from the other daughter. Now, what you see is that adjuncts are cases where the top node is feasibly identical to one of its sister, as said in a joint VP is still a VP. That means that an adjunct, every adjunct should have a representation of the form of a feature set X UX. Now let's see what, is, what happens if you play around with say VP adjunction. Let's assume that there's a VP sleep that has a feature V. Now assume that it merges an adverb and that this adverb for this very reason should be a feature set V, U, V. Then what you get indeed is that there's a V feature on the top node as well. But strikingly, it is not the V feature of sleep that percolates upwards. It's the V feature of often. And that tells us that both sleep and sleep often are indeed maximal V projections because the black V is the highest instance of the V feature of sleep and the blue V is the highest V instance um, of often. So with this in mind, we can solve a junction in labeling. However, under the condition that adjuncts must be specified for the phrases they adjoin to. So for VP adverbs, one should be forced to say that these are elements with a categorical feature set V, UV. The question of course is how does this work for other type of adjuncts, say in a verbal domain. And for this, what I will do now is look at PPs. And the reason is that PP adjuncts are the most flexible adjuncts there are. So if the solution, if a solution may work for PP adjuncts, it should arguably also work for all the other edges. So now let's look at PP adjunction to see how more flexible adjunction could play a role. The question is as follows. If PPs behave as VP adjuncts, they should be analyzed as feature sets V, UV. But such an analysis gives rise to two following questions. The first one, if PP are feature sets V, UV, what actually are prepositions? And secondly, how to account for those PPs that may join not only to VPs, but also to NPs and APs? And I will address these two questions uh, one after the other. The first question at least looks simple. If a PP would indeed be a verbal adjunct, it should be a feature set VUV. But if that is the case, then a preposition should actually be something like a feature set V, U, V, U, D. In that case, a selecting preposition that selects a DP will indeed end up as a feature set V, U, V. However, now we enter a next question. Because as we saw before, in principle, nothing would forbid the reverse ordering where the preposition first merges with a VP, so the feature set V, UV, UD would merge with a feature set V, 
yielding in a feature set V U D that would in turn merge with a DP and the result is a VP. The question though is how bad are these structures where the selection goes in the mirrored order? And the answer is still not so bad. This is what you see in many languages. English eat up the sandwich is a preposition first merging with a verb and then with a DP. And particle verb constructions are actually very, very common in Germanic languages. Here is an example from German. Ich rufe Marie an. I call Mary up. Where up call actually behaves like one verb. Of course, of course, not every preposition and every verb can form a particle verb construction, but the fact that some can, can show that actually this flexible selection requirement is on the right side. Now, to even strengthen this, what you see is that particle verb uh, constructions are complex hats where the verbal subfeatures of the verb do not percolate to the verb particle complex. To see this, let me briefly go back to the German example. In German main clauses, the finite verb is always triggered to raise to the C hat, but the finite verb here is not anrufe, the combination of the preposition and the verb, but it's a sole finite verb, rufe. This tells us that when it comes to syntax, rufe counts as a finite verb, but anrufe doesn't. Now, why would it be? Again, the reason is that if you merge a finite verb with a preposition, it is not the verbal feature of the finite verb itself, but rather the verbal feature of the preposition that percolates up. So the entire particle verb construction has a different verbal feature than the finite verb itself. The subfeatures of the finite verb are no longer present on the top note. Now, what this tells us that the existence of particle verbs actually supports the proposed analysis, but more importantly, forms an empirical argument for flexible selection or ordering, and therefore for the fact that feature sets must indeed be unordered and that selectional requirements are not encoded within a particular order within their lexical representation. Now, a second. Um, consequence of this proposal is that actually PPs, irrespective of whether they're adjuncts or arguments, do not have to be selected by a verb. It's not a verb that selects a PP, it's a PP that selects a verb, as you can see here. And even if the PP is clearly an argument, as in a sentence like, I'm counting on Mary, then it is still the feature set V, U, V, representing on Mary, that merges with count, albeit that count selects a DP of its own. And what you get is count on Mary being a constituent that still selects a DP. So bottom line, both PP arguments and PP adjuncts are elements that select verb or verbal constituents. Verbs do not syntactically select for PPs, PPs syntactically select for verbs. Now, before we go on with this, and this will turn out to be an important ingredient for what is to follow, let me say that it's not the case that PP adjuncts are syntactically fully identical to PP arguments. It is known from the literature um, and fronting or passivization or pseudo passivization plays a big role there, is that PP adjuncts and PP arguments sometimes behave syntactically different. So irrespective of what you say, what you should make sure is that the distinction between a PP argument and a PP adjunct still remains visible. Now, there is a way to do this. And the way to do this is that semantically, a predicate, any predicate first requires its arguments uh, to be saturated before it can be modified by an adjunct. That means that if a particular predicate, like a verb, still selects for a DP argument, anything it merges before that should be an argument as well. That means that if a predicate like count 
such as Count on Mary, first merges with on Mary before it merges with the other DP argument of Count, namely the subject she, on Mary must be taken to be an argument. Only as in the case of an accusative, for instance, if the verb has its DP argument selected prior to the PP that selects the verb, for instance, she arrived at the station, first as merge of arrive and she, the verb no longer selects any DP argument, then modification by the PP at the station being the feature set V, UV, should be fine. What this tells us is that both our edging and argument of PPs are feature sets, but the two are syntactically distinguishable in the sense that a PP argument as in count on Mary, still has a UD feature above it, on top of it, whereas a PP agent, like attestation, no longer has a feature UD on his mother node and therefore counts as an agent. And that tells us, there is something not working with the slides here, but, that tells us that the crucial distinction of between PP arguments and PP agents is that the former, but not the latter, have a feature UD present on their mother node. This being said, basically this says so far, a PP, as long as it merges a verb, is an element that selects the verb. It can do so in a variety of ways, and those ways are indeed all um, grammatically attested. I'm still trying to see what goes wrong here. But now, of course, what we know is that it is not the case that every PP only modifies VPs. PPs may actually modify both NPs and APs. For instance, the book about Obama, or the doctor is afraid of the patient. If PPs, as any other agents select for their sisters and PPs do not only select for verbs, then strictly speaking, there's two logical options. Either PPs ought to be ambiguous between verbal, nominal, and adjectival PPs, and there would be three types of prepositions, or alternatively, there's a supercategory above verbs, nouns, and adjectives that is actually the true element that is modified by PPs. Now, what I will argue is that the latter is indeed the case. First of all, in many languages, there are lexical items that can be used both verbally and nominally. In the functional literature, those elements are called contentives, and they've been used as an argument to say that there is indeed a supercategory present above verbs and nouns. A similar idea actually in a completely different guise has been proposed in generative syntax as well. Many people assume that lexical items are not stored in the lexicon as such, being nouns and verbs, but rather as a-categorial roots. And this is something very much in line uh, with elements having a kind of a supercategorial feature. What they are is something that can later on be specified for either being a verb or being a noun. And finally, from a semantic perspective, verbs, nouns, and adjectives all seem to denote predicates. And this semantic core could then also be said to re be reflected by this supercategory above verbs and nouns. So what I argue, and this is how to solve the PP adjunction problem, is that there is a super feature that I call predicate, and I abbreviate it as pred, which can receive either feature value V for verbs N for ends and maybe an adjective also feature value A for adjectives or maybe adjectives are unvalued predicates. That's not of any relevance for here. I apologize for bribing a cat that is otherwise interfering with my presentation, um, but let's continue here. If this is the case, what you could say is that what happens when you merge a verb with a PP is that actually it is not the case that 
this PP exists of a feature set VUV, but rather of a feature set with an unvalued pred feature and an unvalued U pred feature. By merging with a feature V, to be more precise, with a feature predicate colon V, that is a predicate already valued for V, the PP may actually be V valued and therefore be a feature set predicate colon V, U predicate colon V, which is a notation variant of V, U, V, and then trigger um, yield a VP when it is merged with a VP already. Much in the same vein, if you have a noun and you merge it with a feature set pred, U pred, then because the merger is with the noun, the PP will end up being a feature set pred n, U pred n, which is similar to a feature set n, U n. And therefore, if a PP joins to a noun phrase, it will actually trigger or yield a new noun phrase. So if this is correct, prepositions are actually nothing but elements that are feature sets pred, U pred, unvalued for V or N, which should become valued for V or N along the way, and which in addition contain a feature UD that selects for it. What this brings us or what this buys is that if prepositions are indeed such feature sets, the behavior of PPs as nouns verbs or even adjectival modifiers naturally follows and the analysis of engines as elements selecting their modifier can actually be maintained. And with this, we go to the final part of the labeling discussion presented here. So far, the proposal predicts that every selector forms the label. And this has been a very successful approach in many domains but almost in a quarter main of selection, it has not. The bottom line of the problem is that it's really not the case that it's syntactically encoded on a verb what the category, what the category of the argument is. Verbs arguably don't C select, but rather S select, where the S of S selection stands for semantics. Take a verb like no. One can merge no with a DP, with a PP and a CP argument. Mary knows Bill, Mary knows about Peter, Mary knows that Theo is ill. Now, in this case, one would rather not say that syntactically the verb selects his argument. But if syntactic selection and labeling are in one way or the other related, then it should be inevitable that given that knows projects a VP, and not a DP, a PP, or a CP, that actually it should be the verb that syntactically, that is C selects, syntactically selects its argument. So far, however, one step in this direction has already been made, namely that um, PPs can be said, even PP arguments can be said not to be selected by their verb they indeed select their verb, even though they do not end up in heading PPs, they still end up these PP arguments in ending, having the merger with the verb end up in a VP. Now, the same holds for a DP argument. If a verb selects for a DP argument, it could still be made, modified by a PP argument, sleep in the bed, and this gives you a VP that still requires a DP argument. So bottom line, PPs do not form an argument against the claim that verbs C select. In fact, one can maintain C selection by verbs um, completely while still allowing for the presence of PP arguments. But if the two types of arguments that then would form an argument against C selection are then DPs and CPs, a next step in opening up the understanding of C selection by verbs suggests itself. Because before saying that verbs really may select two differently, two syntactically different 
categories, namely DPs or CPs, one should first actually evaluate what the real syntactic difference is between a DP argument and the CP argument. And as it turns out, there aren't that many. CP arguments share a number of prototypical properties of DPs. For instance, CP arguments can control agreement. That it rains is clear. Third person agreement on the um, um, finite verb is. CPs can be referred to by pronouns. That John is ill, I know, can be rephrased as that is nowhere, that is a DP referring to the CP John is ill, or what is denoted by that CP. And maybe the strongest argument is actually that CP arguments take play a role in case competition, whereas case is normally only assigned to DPs. Take the following example, that Bill left Susan shocked her. Her is an accusative. If accusatives are dependent case, they can only appear when there's also a nominative DP in the same domain. The only candidate for such a nominative DP should be the entire R clause, clausal argument that is, that bill left Susan. So there's actually good reasons to assume that every C argument CP is a special form of a DP. Um, and this is not being proposed for the first time here, already back in the 60s by Ross and later on by Rosenbaum. People have argued that there's strong correspondences between at least certain types of CP arguments and DPs, paving the way for a proposal and Kastner in 2015 already comes close um, that says that CP arguments are actually particular kinds of DPs. The way I would implement that here is that a complement type like that is an element that indeed selects a TP, but the element itself is a determiner again. So the feature set of a complementizer like that is a feature set D, U, T, unlike other determiners, more canonical determiners that are actually feature sets D, U, N. And what happens then is that a complementizer like that may merge with a TP, like John left, and the result that John left is a syntactic element of that has a feature set D, which then by definition is a DP. But this means that every verb that selects a DP or a CP argument actually is a verb that selects a DP argument, either a more canonical DP argument or a special CP DP argument. And this allows us much along the lines of Susan Wurmbrandt back already in 2004 by saying that every verb actually must carry a feature UD, that is every verb should syntactically select for a DP and that DP can of course then be a DP argument or a CP argument. Now, this again opens up the way to understand how do exactly the selectional properties of verbs work. What one can say is that a verb at least selects one DP argument because the subject is always a DP or a clausal DP. Um, but what happens with those verbs that select two DP arguments? Clearly, what is not possible is to say that such verbs carry two UD features. The reason for that is that sets are unordered and therefore the set VUD UD is formally equivalent to the feature set VUD. This gives us another possibility. In order to be able to select for more than one DP argument, a verb actually needs to merge with first with another DP selecting element which could be a preposition, for instance, or maybe the category known as little v, before a second DP argument can be merged in. Here is how this works for little v. First, there is a big v, a verb, that selects one DP argument. That would be the canonical object. And the result is a vp. This vp may be selected by a little v. This little v does not only select a big VP, but also a DP in a specifier. And then this DP in a specifier of the little V would then be the second higher argument. Now, this is a very traditional view. 
it only says that little v is there by virtue of being able to select a second dp. There's a bunch of striking facts here. And the first one is that little v now looks to be featurely almost identical to a preposition in the sense that it selects a particular VP and it selects a DP. This is not a disadvantage. In fact, one could think of little v indeed as a kind of a verbal preposition where little v, and there's a typo there, it should not be big V, it should be little v, is nothing but a feature set, big V, UV, that is U big V, QD, now, there's a bunch of advantages of this. First of all, it would strengthen the resemblance between what looks like two different types of assigners of accusative case. Normally, the two classical assigners of accusative case are little v and p, but if you unify the two, then there's only one type that can be said to be the canonical assigner of accusative case. Secondly, it would simplify the way that TP can select, or T had, sorry, can select. Normally, one should have to distinguish between a T had that selects a little VP and a T had that selects a big VP, because the two are categorical, uh, categorically different. However, if little V is actually a big V selecting another big VP, then a little VP is nothing but a special kind of big VP but that would in turn mean that every T hat always selects a VP and nothing else, at least nothing else in that domain. So this further allows us to simplify the overall picture that is behind selection. And with this in mind, we can now address the question, which verbs select for DPs, that is, which verbs uh, actually carry a UD feature? Now, there's a number of properties um, that, all ver that apply to all verbs. First of all, all the arguments need to be base generated inside the little VP slash big VP. Second, since you never have a PP argument that is a subject, at least one DP needs to be uh, selected as a subject by every verb. In addition, every DP needs to be selected in a structure and as we saw before, a verb itself cannot select from more than one DP. The most straightforward way to account for all these things is by arguing that each verb must carry exactly one feature UD. And one can even go further then and hypothesize that what distinguishes verbal from normal predicates is actually the presence of a DP selecting feature that is a feature UD. In a way, this way, all the different verb types can be easily represented. A transitive verb carries a feature UD, which selects the object DP, and then a second verbal head, traditionally known as little v, selects the DP subject. Transitive verbs that select in parentheses or quotation marks PP arguments are not really transitive verbs. They're actually um, intransitive verbs carrying a UD feature that are furthermore selected by a PP argument. An accusative intransitive verbs just carry a feature UD which selects the object DP, which is further promoted to be the subject. And finally, an ergative intransitive verbs carry a feature UD as well, but I will argue that these first merge with little v. The structures then look as follows. Follows. There's a big V, the ergative, an ergative verb that has a feature UD, but nothing forces this verb to first merge as a DP. It may very well be the case that this verb first merges as little v and only then merges with a DP present in a specifier of little vp. And note that this is the typical structure of any ergative verb construction. Um, the fact that you have a UD feature here and a UD feature there present in both sisters is not a problem because even if the two both percolate to the higher node, still only one ends up in the relevant feature set. And this comes along with an empirical prediction that to the extent that the semantics allow it, an ergatives should actually allow 
particular objects. And this is indeed attested as it is a well-known fact that unergative intransitive verbs, unlike unaccusative intransitive verbs, can actually take a cognate object such as I walk to walk or I dream a dream. Now, finally, and we're almost coming to an end, the original claim that abstract case is something um, that could be thought of as licensing by a functional hat could be understood as well. If the thing is that if a semantically a verb allows for multiple arguments, syntactically it cannot select multiple DPs. The reason being that sets are unordered. That means that every additional DP will have to be introduced by a separate functional hat. And if non-DP selecting elements cannot be merged as a DP, this actually derives the necessity for every DP apart from the object of a verb to be selected by a higher functional hat. This is exactly what the illusion is that abstract case is about, namely licensing by functional hat. The idea that every DP requires a functional hat of its own, being a finite T, being little v, being PP, is nothing but the result of the fact that every DP has to be selected into the structure and every DP outside the canonical DP object um, requires an additional functional hat to do so. Now, this was a very long story about labeling and selection in the verbal domain, including an excursion on what PPs actually are about. But what I try to show now, and this is where everything will round up, is that actually the mechanism that we presented here, and I think there's some reasons to assume that this is at least on the right track, also allows us to understand all the dependencies um, that we introduced in the very beginning of this talk. In fact, it even accounts for their particular behavior. Let us look therefore at long distance feature checking, also known as agree. Um, and for that, recall the principle of containment of syntactic information. Syntactic information cannot just disappear in the tree. All syntactic features percolate unless there's a principled reason why they cannot do so. Now, by definition, independent features can never percolate beyond the maximal projection. A maximal projection is the highest instance of a dependent feature. A VP is the highest instance of a projecting V feature. By contrast, dependent features always percolate up until they stand in a sister relation with a matching independent feature. This triggers the asymmetry between dependent and independent features with respect to distance uh, relations when it comes to checking. Long distance dependencies are actually instances of nothing but extended selection. So to come up with an example of this, let's assume that there is a DP that is a WH um, element. So therefore it carries a feature D colon WH. Um, and this WH element stands in an interrogative clause where the interrogative clause has a Q feature. Following work, for instance, by Boscovich, it is understood that every WH term that can only appear in questions has a feature UQ that must agree on a distance with the Q feature present on the C head. So let's look um, at the structure that analyzes this. There is a DP, the question word, that carries a feature D colon WH, and in addition, it has a feature UQ. It's selected by a verb that carries a feature V and a feature UD. And as a result of that, the top note, the regular VP, still carries the feature UQ because the DP has not been merged with any element that has a Q feature as part of its feature set yet. This goes on till there's a little VP, till there's the TP. So even the TP still has a feature UQ. The moment, the DP merges with a C hat that contains a Q feature, only then the UQ feature can no longer percolate up. And this is nothing but long distance agreement. This is the fact that all the other exist, observed um, 
instances of syntactic dependencies are actually allowed to play long distance. The reason why every element carrying a so-called unadorable feature that by now we think of as a dependent feature, that all those dependent features can be checked by any C commanding independent feature is that there's nothing that stops percolating all these independent features, sorry, dependent features till they're the very sister of a corresponding independent features. That is the kind of agree relations that underlie negative concord, sequence of tense, binding, um, and phi agreement in general are exactly the same kind of dependencies that underlie selection as we saw in a lot of detail. And even movement can be accounted for in exactly the same way. What we see is that the C hat that has a Q feature also has a feature UWH. That means that it wants a WH element to end up in a specifier position. If there's no longer a WH element deep um, present in enumeration, the only way to do so is to have uh, the lower DP, that is the WH item DP, to be remerged with C bar, yielding the CP that now no longer has a feature UWH or WH because the DP itself has a feature WH and it merges with C bar that has UWH. So movement here again is taken to be the result of a U feature, in this case UWH, to be the sister of a corresponding WH feature. Any long distance dependency is nothing but extended selection, both those involving movement and those involving what you could call long distance agreement. Um, or other long distance, long distance dependencies. The same applies to negative concord. Here is just a structure underlying an Italian um, example where you may have one or more DPs as a feature UNEC. All those UNEC features percolate up all the way till they're the sister of a negative marker that carries a feature neck. And the result is a top note that no longer contains either a neck feature or a unique feature. So to summarize negative concord, binding, sequence of tense, licensing of strict MPIs, licensing of speech act morphology and eloquitivity, phenomena that I haven't illustrated here, but that work in the same vein, can all be accounted for along the lines of what you could call upper degree, that is the idea that the dependent feature needs to be C commanded by an independent feature. And the fact that independent features need to C command dependent features follows from those features being purely categorical features on top of a principle that says that features in principle percolate up unless they stand in a sisterhood relation between an independent and an independent feature. The only cases for which this would not apply are cases of what you could call downward agree Phi agree um, between a lower goal and a higher probe, as for instance, in the case of the English their constructions that I illustrated before. However, what we saw before, those dependencies do not involve structure building, unlike all the elements, uh, sorry, unlike all the dependencies that we saw before, those dependencies only involve structure enrichment. Um, and what I've tried to argue here is how dependent and independent features, unlike valid or unvalid features, drive syntactic structure building. So let me conclude. Formal features, I argue, emerge under four meaning mismatches. Thinking of formal features to be categorical features opens up the way to understand three different types of syntactic dependencies, namely labeling, what you could call selection or C-selection, and long distance checking, the proposal makes a number of predictions concerning injunctions, roots being lexical supercategories, the overlap between CPs and DPs, among many others, but it raises, of course, many, many, many more open questions that I'm very happy to discuss with you, either in the question period after this talk or when people watch this um, lecture on YouTube, feel free to send me an email and I'll do my very best to respond quickly and have a discussion online.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hedy. Um, we do have a few questions um, from the chat. So the first one is from, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, uh, Yadiel Hadnan. And he asks, uh, how your approach, I, I think, uh, regarding feature percolation and so forth, um, relates to the operation fusion uh, from distributed morphology. So fusion from distributed morphology concerns the fact that different feature values may play a role on different elements. I'm a little bit vague here. Um, what I've tried to show, there is a difference to be made here between the proposal that I make for structure building within syntax and for what may go on um, at the post-syntactic level. Um, what, I've, what I'm arguing here is that the mechanism underlying ultimately determines what kind of structures can be built um, and what kind of structures cannot be built. That's structure building. Upon structure building, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes later, structure enrichment takes place that involves feature valuation. Feature valuation allows multiple values to end up on all kinds of different positions in the syntactic structure. And that may in turn feed all kinds of realization rules. So I would not think of it, think of there being a direct correspondence between the two. Um, the mechanism itself is different, but rather structure building is the vehicle that creates the structures that can be the input of further modification, further feature modification at a post syntactic level where they determine realization. I hope I'm answering the question in a not completely um, irrelevant way, um, but otherwise let me know. Okay, I think you did. Um, we have another question from John. Um, uh, and he asks, um, I'm gonna read his, his comment. Um, Often it's said that a feature on a head is interpretable if it contributes to semantic interpretation. Won't this be subjective in some cases, whether a feature contributes to semantics or not? So I'm taking a different stand here. So what is referred to as an interval feature itself is something that for me never gives rise to um, interpretation at LF. It never ever makes a semantic contribution. The only thing that can make a semantic contribution are the semantic features or the semantic representation of that same functional head, which is an independent thing. It's just that for the language learner, there's generally a cue to assign, say, a feature past to something that also has the semantics of a past tense or a feature neck to something that has the semantics of a negation, but the two are independent. That is, in terms of the feature architecture, there's really three types of features, formal features, semantic features, phonological features, without any overlap. And the fact that syntactic features look closer to semantics than to phonology is purely due to the fact that the learning algorithm says only if you have a four meaning mismatch with respect to a particular semantic category, then you have formal features um, that emerge and those formal features may, therefore these formal features may encode um, the fact that some element that has the relevant semantics must be included in the structure, but it's an indirect connection to the extent that there is a connection between formal and semantic features, that connection lies in learnability and not in the architecture of grammar. Okay. Um, now I have a question on, of my own. Um, have you thought about uh, a nominal adjectives and what kind of features would they carry? So what, can, what example would you have in mind? Uh, no, I'm thinking that if PPs are, you know, pred, carry a pred and valid feature um, in order to be able to, and you made a distinction between predicative adjectives. Uh, so th yeah. that, was, that was, I'm thinking like, for example, stacking adjectives, how would that work? It's an excellent question. And 
for a purely technical, um, as a technical question, can I use the whiteboard instead of share my? Yes, of course. So the question that Thais is um, asking is, if a regular adjective like tall in Mary is tall, if this adjective is actually something that would be pred or maybe pred a, that doesn't really matter, some kind of a predicate, how do you deal with something like a tall girl? Now, Tall is here a nominal agent. It adjoins to a noun, and tall girl has the same feature or distribution, has the same distribution as girl, and therefore tall girl should have the same features. That means that tall girl should have a feature N just as girl should have a feature N. And this then makes a prediction that tall here should actually be a feature set and un. That is a nominal or an attributive adjective does not behave like a feature pred a, but rather like a feature set n u n. Now this of course gives a question, namely, why would you have very similar arguments in your language with two completely different feature sets. What I argue is actually that the attributive adjective tool is the result of merger with say the predicate uh, tool. And a nominalizing hat that is unpronounced in English that would be a fe feature set pred. My handwriting is horrible. A and then N U N. So what happens with a nominal adjective is that it first gets modified by what you could call a nominalizer, then it becomes a nominal agent, it merges with a noun, and it becomes, uh, it yields a noun phrase. Now, for English, this would be rather stipulative, but if you look at many languages, so I'm a speaker of Dutch, native speaker, in Dutch, there's never ever any inflectional marking on a predicative used adjective but there is inflectional markings on attributively used adjectives. And what I hypothesize is that actually the inflectional marking is not just something as a feature value, but rather there is indeed a head that gets realized by means of inflection morphology in those languages. But it's ultimately something that in the literature is traditionally referred to as a linker. It's a thing that is a category chainer, changer, namely change a category from predicate into nominal adjectives. It's a very good question. Thanks. Nobody asked it, but um, I am aware of some people that are watching that may be a little bit confused by it. So could you explain again, when would checking take place and when would valuation take place? So checking, so every U feature, call it UX for that matter, irrespective of whether it has a value slot or not, at some point needs to be um, in a sisterhood relation with a corresponding feature X. That is all there is for narrow syntax. And if UX is here and the sister, there's no X on the sisters here or here, it will percolate first to this node then to this node, and then at this node, it finds X as its sister, and therefore at the top node, neither X nor UX is present. That is what structure building in syntax does. Now, what we know is that in addition, UX also needs to be valued. And what I argue is that valuation can actually take place in two ways. 
either directly, that is the moment X checks UX as a side effect, it also values it. That is the kind of feature valuation that you find, for instance, under spec head agreement, one of the most canonical types of feature valuation, but it is not the only way. Suppose that for whatever reason, this element that is the checker lacks the relevant values to value this element, then other elements can complement the fee feature valuation post syntactically, that is at PF, as long as the relevant valuer and valuee stand in a particular syntactic configuration. Valuation for me is a weaker syntactic rela um, relation and checking. Checking is what builds your structures. And ultimately, any structure of which at the top node there is no U feature is a grammatical uh, structure. That's what syntax does. Valuation can take place along the way if the checker and a checkee, that is the sisters, stand, um, if one of the sisters can value the other sister. But it's not the case that if that's not possible, that valuation cannot be complemented later on um, at PF by means of other goals. So the two important things for me is that valuation is not um, a structure building mechanism. Valuation is not something that triggers syntactic operations. It's rather the result of syntactic operations. And it can apply in a much more flexible way. That is, there's more, multiple potential valuers for a particular unvalued feature, whereas the potential checkers for a particular U feature are much more restricted. So a little bit old fashioned in this sense that I would like to take back the emphasis from valuation that I think is a slightly more peripheral phenomenon to checking, which I think is more in the core of syntax. Okay, thank you. Um, there are no more questions. So I think um, we can finish here for today. Um, thank you very much for all the questions. Also those who have watched, thanks for watching. And as said before, because there was also a lot of stuff in it, um, feel free to write me an email if there's any further questions. Okay, uh, so we, on behalf of Abrolin, I'd like to thank you, Hede, for um, accepting to participate in this event, in this series. We are very, I think everybody is very happy. Your, your lecture has contributed a lot, and I'm sure a lot of people will be able to profit from watching it later. And um, just as a final uh, remark, um, on behalf of the of Abrelin as well, I'd like to stress how important it is uh, for Brazilian researchers to join the association. In case you haven't, this initiative is only possible um, by the contribution of members. So if you are a Brazilian researcher and you have not joined the association yet, please consider doing so. Um, and that is it from my part. Thank you again. Thank you very much for the invitation and for setting up this wonderful lecture series. And uh, thanks everybody for attending. And that's it. Thank you for everybody who watched it and uh, we'll stop you for today. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>